Well, we might start off with a definitional change for you. We've all been talking about millennials. Actually, that's history. The new definition is called generation like. And if you want to watch a great show, watch Frontline with that title in it. It will show you how the next generation beyond the millennials are working. They spend more time making decisions based on what everybody else thinks is a group than individually. And that's a very different way of appealing to your clients. So today we're going to talk about mobility, but in a little bit different context. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to go through a bunch of devices and tell you what's going to happen. I think the video beforehand kind of set the stage very well. Mobility is beginning to blend into everything, and I'm going to show you some of the evidence about that. Uh, so let's get started. So Gartner is famous for doing a lot of surveys from its clients. And we have a huge base of CIOs that we survey every year. We are a global company. We have most of the large companies in the world as clients. And we ask the CIOs what they think their top priorities are. So in 2013, mobility was almost at the top of the list. The number one factor is analytics, the analysis of information I'm sure everybody's concerned about. And as we looked at that point in time, we introduced something called the nexus of forces, which is on the right. And we saw that there were four basic forces shaping technology for the, for the future. There was mobility. There was social, this ability for all of us to connect and inform each other about things that we like or don't like. There was a the move to the cloud, less about the device and more about storing things in the cloud. And it was about information, all that data that you can gather about people. There's a very interesting product called Google Photos. If you don't have it, you ought to go get it. It's for free from Google. And every time you take a picture, it will be stored up in the cloud. And you can store every picture you're going to take for the rest of your life up in the cloud for free. Why are they doing that? The reason they're doing it is because the value of information to Google has exceeded the cost of storage. And they're happy to store everything for the rest of your life. You can imagine that they have every possible view of the Eiffel Tower taken by every citizen in the world who's been there. So when you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower, they're going to label it Eiffel Tower because they know exactly what that is. And this is all part of what Google's putting back into their system called deep neural learning. Now, how does it relate to mobility? Mobility is basically the data collection mechanism that's bringing all that information together. Tremendous amount of information, probably bigger than all the stars in the universe uh, are bits of data that are being collected. And it will be stored forever. Big problem because once something bad is reported about you, it's going to live in the internet for a long time. And we don't have our laws re ready to take care of that yet. Uh, but that's important. Now, what's happened last year? In our next survey, we saw mobility go down. And I expect when we do the survey this year, it will go down even further. We've seen the inquiries from our customers about mobile devices specifically go down. What's happening? Well, it turns out that those four forces are becoming integrated into everything you do. So it's less about mobility today and more about how mobility is influencing and enriching everything we do. The Internet of Things is not possible without mobility because mobility is about wireless connections. Bringing all those things together is a foundational concept uh, for the future of technology. Now, to show you a little bit further, is mobility really has ceased to exist as something by itself, as it shows at the bottom of the tree. And it's launched all these other things. If you recall when you got your first iPhone, right? You brought up a website and you used Pinch and Zoom and said, this is pretty cool, right? I can make this website that was built for a large screen work on this small screen. But actually what it told us is that we'd done a very poor job. We had built all of our applications for this fixed size CRT and now we're being confronted with all these different shapes and sizes. And we can't make it work very well. So the industry is undergoing a major shift fueled by mobility to redesign our applications so they work on everything. And don't think it's just a mobile thing. Next time you get a screen for your PC, you're going to get a 4K screen. 
And your IT person is going to look pretty stupid when there's more real estate occupied by two black strips on either side of that application, right? And then the other things here listed are other things that mobility has influenced. It is the great influence. It's the ultimate test case for anything we do. Make it work on mobile, and it works everything out on everything else well. Next thing I want to show you here is a diagram of an unfortunate event. But it shows you all the things that mobility is going to glue together in these long streams of activities that are interlinked together. The interlinking of activities from mobile is one of the big things it brings to the environment. So a crash occurred. The smartphone knew from its accelerometer that a crash had occurred. Things in your clothing will be able to detect alive, dead, you know, what hurt, et cetera, and so on through this series of events, contacting legal, medical staff, et cetera. All these things will happen instantaneously as a result of mobility. So that's one situation. Korea, where this picture was taken, is one of the most mobilized societies in the world. And what a citizen of Korea can do today, as they're going to take the train home, is they walk up to the entrance there. There's a big poster of all of these goods that people can buy from a grocery store. They simply hold up their phone, take pictures of the things that they want. And by the time they get to their destination, there's somebody waiting with a grocery bag with all the groceries there for them to take home. So again, as you think about your own business, don't think about a particular event. Always ask yourself, what comes next? And try to automate the two things together. And then maybe what's next after that? So you have to think outside your own environment to think about the experiences. Now, this is a video to show you a little different aspect of mobility. This is from one of my favorite movies called Minority Report. And John Anderton is walking into this mall, and you'll, there'll be a Lexus commercial here, that's resulting from its recognition of him through his eyes, through cameras that are embedded everywhere, and it shows, starts to show him ads. Now, the second part of this video is interesting because during the movie, he has an eye transplant because he doesn't want to be recognized anymore. And he walks into a shopping mall and it thinks he's somebody else. So there's both a good side and a bad side. So just run the video. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less So Mr. Yakimoto was the unfortunate person who lost his eyes to John Anderton. Um, but you can see what's happened here. And at CES this year, Corning, who makes all the glass for a lot of the screens on the devices that you see, had a display it was called the Age of Glass. And what they're pre predicting, and I think it's largely true, is that you're going to see huge video walls everywhere, in shopping malls, et cetera. You're starting to see the beginning of this. Screens are so cheap today, you can put them everywhere. Right? So your conference room is going to be all glass. Shopping malls will be all glass. And these things will happen in the very near future. Right? Fueled by mobility in reverse. It's recognized who you are, and so it's, the environment is bringing things to you instead of you bringing things to the environment. So in this particular uh, chart, we try to summarize a couple things to show you some of the key things that are happening in mobility. We've got social engagement. This generation-like, crowdsourcing, information being transmitted at lightning speed. They can use a lot more knowledge before they go shopping. They can walk into a shopping mall, look at an item, take a picture of a barcode, and know where to get the best deal. If you look at business opportunities, we're getting new business models through all the analytics. People are creating new products um, all the time through all this information that's there. 
products and services, we've got smart homes. My house has a whole bunch of things that are interrelated to each other. When I walk into my house, the sensors from my Nest uh, uh, fire detectors know that I'm there and other things happen in my home. And it's just the beginning. This is sort of the beginning of all this IoT stuff. Um, Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, which is the new home of the 49ers, has sent, has, has, is kind of the hallmark of a software-enabled stadium. Now, what they do in all football players today in the United States, they wear two sensors underneath their shoulder pads. And there are detectors in every stadium that can plot their movements throughout the day within six inches, right? And they use that, that information to fuel some of the video games for kids so they have real simulations of how the player, players work. Um, it's important to understand that when you build a product today, it's not the product you sell anymore because you may, will make less and less money off that product, but it's the things you sell afterward and the continued relationship fueled by mobility that will be important. So let's talk, talk about some key technology trends. So on the left side is algorithms. What fuels a lot of this technology today, because it happens at the speed of light, are algorithms that you're going to trust to make decisions on your behalf, to give you information that you need at the time you need it. There's a university today who's built an algorithm that can use your phone to determine whether you're happy or sad. And of course, you'd like to sell somebody when they're happy and less when they're sad, unless you're selling products for antidepressant, right? Um, on, the, on the device side, these are edge technologies that gather and process information. Um, on the, the services side, what's happening today is people are beginning to understand that they must make mobility part of the bill of materials. You can't sell a product and say, by the way, after you buy this, here's our internet site. It has to be an integrated part of what you do. I don't care whether you're selling financial services, whether you're selling cars, whatever it might be. That needs to be part of the bill of materials. And of course, social and political ills. We just saw recently this battle between the FBI and Apple. It was interesting that Tim Cook from Apple is very much against helping the government, but Bill Gates came out and said he's for it, right? We don't really understand yet how we're going to deal with all these issues of privacy. I'm here to tell you today, if you don't already know it, your privacy is gone. There's so much information about all of you on the internet that you're never going to stop it. What we need are laws that help you to get hauled into court about how that information can be used. And what Apple's asking, I mean, what the FBI is asking for is a backdoor in encryption. And I actually tend to side a little bit with Apple on this. What we need to do is when people establish their phones, to provide permissions for a front door to be established. So most companies today have tools that provide this front door. Turns out in San Bernardino, they didn't put that technology on the phone, and that's why they're having so much trouble retrieving it. <clears throat> the next thing here is about the rise of the virtual personal assistant. Um, today, many of you have a lot of apps. You may not get to them. And the reason you don't get to them is you don't have enough time and effort to do all of that. So virtual personal assistants are the evolution of these different steps here where you begin to give you know, voluntarily more and more information to these algorithms that store your information, your knowledge. And they begin to bring things to you. So for example, little ones that you probably use today is if your bank balance falls below a certain amount, it begins to tell you. You don't have to check that bank application every day or every hour to see what your bank balance is. And more and more things are going to happen and come to you. So virtual personal assistants are going to be the evolution after apps. Apps are really dying. And on our next slide, we talk about this post-app era. Right? We know that about 40% of our customers are done downloading any more apps because they've got enough. They can't handle them all. Many of the apps that they have on their phones today, they can't use at all. So what's happening here is a progression of things. Um, they've started off uh, entering uh, using an app, but as they requested from their suppliers and the suppliers delivered more and more of this automated experience, they've moved more to contextual-based interaction with users. 
Where is this user? What they're doing? Are they in my store? Are they at home? You know, what do they need to know and when do they need to know it? How do I make sure I don't pester them beyond belief like a telemarketer might do that? So all of these things are technologies that we're talking about at Gardner and I think you need to begin to think about because if you're going to be providing technology in the future, it has to be supportive rather than requiring the user to do all the work. Ultimately, this comes about ubiquitous, becomes ubiquitous services, services that deliver to you what you need when you need it. Now, getting down on the hardware a little bit, it's important we, we think about where are the technologies going. We've stopped calling things laptops and notebooks and smartphones. They're all endpoint computers that sit at the end of a network, and they all do the same thing. What's a, what's a car in the future? It's basically a software-defined vehicle, right? It's less about the hardware and what it does. It's really about how it reacts in many situations, right? Self-driving cars, cars that avoid accidents, cars that give you information when you need. That's where the value is. That's where the money is going to come from long term, is having a, a relationship with that customer and them giving you revenue for the service you can provide for that information. You're at an interesting crossroads as an industry. Do you let Apple and Google control this? Or do you actually control it yourself, right? Who's going to take the profit and, more importantly, the information that comes back from all of this? Cars are going to generate more, a tremendous amount of information, part of that number that Ken gave earlier. And what you do with that information and you provide services is really a challenge for the industry. And smartphones, um, they're just black rectangles anymore. We're done with in innovation today. Unless we all grow more arms and legs, you know, it's all going to be pretty much the same. They're going to get faster, they're going to get thinner, they're going to, the screens are going to get better, et cetera. But there's really, you know, we've lost excitement. We've seen Apple's volume start to, to, to flatten, right? Why? Because many of us have a phone, we're going, hey, we got everything we need. What more do we need? We need more software, we need more things to happen, more interconnectedness, but less and less about the device. And interesting things are happening in terms of shapes. We have yesterday announced at Mobile World Congress a device that's a phone that you can dock in a cradle and turn into a desktop. So what's a desktop anymore? It's just an arbitrary word, right? Where do you define the end of a smartphone and the beginning of a tablet? Some of you define that at five inches, some of you define it at four inches, some of you define it at seven inches. That's an arbitrary definition. So it's important you look at from a security standpoint, from every standpoint, all devices as endpoints and treat them equally. Applications must flow across all those boundaries. Now let's talk about wearables. Wearables are more than a smartwatch. They are many, many different things. One of the most interesting things that Microsoft announced is something called HoloLens, which is part of augmented reality. Kind of like scuba goggles I can put on, and if I'm looking to repair something, what will happen is I will get audio uh, instructions on how to repair it, and in my vision field, I will see pointers to the device because it's recognized what it is, to tell me how to repair that particular item, right? And it's not so strange that this is going to happen. And so somebody could potentially repair their own car or fix a light switch, right, all through these particular guides. There's some wild and crazy stuff. There's something called selfie drones. You know how the selfie sticks we all hate that everybody carries around because they hit us with them? Well, now there's a little drone that you can put in your pocket that'll take off, fly away from you, and take a picture of you, right? There's actually a car on the market today which where the trunk opens up, a drone comes out, and it will, take, it will follow your car at any speed and take pictures of you driving, right? So really crazy things happening. A lot of healthcare at CES today, this year, there was a lot of healthcare things to help uh, improve health. And Gardner last year gave everybody a Fitbit. And what I'm sure Gartner is doing is not tracking me necessarily because I wouldn't like that, but they're putting the data collectively to go into the healthcare organization and say, well, in 2015, our employees took you know, 50 million steps, and now they're doing 70 million steps, so why don't you give us a break, break on your healthcare costs? Next thing that's happening is we're getting innovation in how we interact with these things. We have pen, we have touch, we have typing, we have voice. We're even going to have thought control, and that's not so strange. There have been a lot of work in that area. So the, the physical keyboard's going away, and we have to think about all of these that are interchangeable. You will go from 
sitting at your desk saying, I've got to leave for a meeting, carry that experience through the cloud into the car and start talking to it and interacting with it. Voice recognition has got ex gotten extremely good these days. Ability to recognize text, written text has gotten extremely good and will only get better. Now all this is going to be delivered by a variety of players. Last year we took 15 criteria to figure out who were the biggest influencers in mobile. And a lot of these you'll probably recognize, such as Apple and Google, but some you may not recognize. For example, Tencent. Tencent is an internet provider, a huge internet provider in, in China. Alibaba, who has a relationship with, with Yahoo, who hadn't been doing so well, may in fact come over here now and begin to rival Google, fueled by all of the money that gets from Chinese citizens, right? Um, there's Xiaomi at the bottom here. They are a very low cost smartphone provider that's very aggressive in getting into other industries. The superpowers, what they're trying to do is, and I think ultimately what everybody in this group is trying to do, they're trying to be the Walmarts in the sky, right? And when these people get power, those people who don't find a way to work with them are going to be a disadvantage. As we all know in the physical retail world, Walmart sets the tone. If you don't give them the lowest cost and you're out of here, they'll get somebody else. So these people are having great, great power and they're beginning to integrate everything and they will, if they don't already today, sell more and more cars uh, as time goes forward. So that PAR chart you saw before will shift and these, these vendors will try to benefit and believe me, they have tremendous amount of assets to use the information at their disposal. So let's talk about some of the challenges as an organization you might face. Um, what are the top CIO challenges? First of all, they have to realize that mobility, as I said earlier, becomes invisible. That's a component of everything they do. And they have to look at some of their old line ways of thinking and change. Let's take a salesperson 10 years ago and let's take a salesperson I might hire today. 10 years ago, you might hire a salesperson who's really good at doing blitz days on the phone. They're good at talking to people, they take people out to lunch, etc. The new worker today has probably handled more people on a personal basis per hour than that old line person on the telephone using Facebook and other social things, right? But yet they come into their environment today and the first thing they hear from IT is you can't use Facebook in here, right? So we need to think about these particular tools as a foundation for how we're going to be able to do things in the future. New salespeople today think differently. You can't take your old technologies and methods and shove it into them because you'll lose the productivity. They're a mile wide and very thin in terms of depth. They have, all have attention deficit disorder, right? They do things fast. They rapidly think through things. And it's not that that's bad. That's just, just like when we came into the workforce, we did things differently than our parents. So you have to think about them differently. And mo they're going to expect a huge degree of mobility to, as part of the equipment. I mean, this is happening all over the world. I talked to the Defense Department of Defense. And I was with the Navy. And they say, you know, we hire these 18-year-old recruits. And when they were 12, they got an Xbox. And they learned how to play games, right, on, on their their Xbox. And then when they turned 16, we gave them a smartphone and they ran all these applications. They could do all these amazing things. Then they turn 18 and we list them in the Navy. We put them on a high-tech submarine and we give them a clipboard and a pencil to fill out a form, right? That's the challenge today is we've got to take our businesses and move them into the future. Um, ultimately, you have to operate in what we call bimodal IT. That's a phrase that Gartner has put together. There are certain things like networking that you have to keep stable. You have to keep them running all the time. But there's a huge amount of things that you have to let freedom reign. You have to let people experiment with. You have to engage the user. You have a lot of people today who have ideas, but they feel oppressed because they don't get to expose them. So there are new organizations we call Mobile Center of Excellence or Endpoint Center of Excellence where people can bring ideas, and these are not groups which traditionally exist in IT to stop people from doing things. These are things that we have to try to get them to do things. To say, when somebody comes to me and say, you know, I found a new way through this cool application to do my expenses, 
How can I do that? We find a way to get that to happen, not to prevent it. Uh, in the workplace, the entire workplace, we've got to really spend time empowering these users to do a better job of coming forth with ideas and innovation. We've got to make sure that wireless is everywhere. They can connect anytime they anywhere. Uh, you know, most workers today, they grow up with cell phones. They come into a lot of companies today, and they sit at their desk, and there's a desk phone, a brick that we've left with what we've, we have for 50 years. What kid today grows up with a desk phone in their room? None, right? So we've got to make sure that our workplace begins to reflect the innovation and culture of the people that come in. You will find employees that will go to work for you or not go to work for you because of the technology you give them. It's part of what they do every day. As we look at the last slide here, we take a look at the digital worker themselves. Uh, it's about empowerment of these individuals. It's about giving them advanced devices, giving them ways to build their own and customize their own workplace. Um, and to, to look at the collaboration tools in a different way. Many people who propose collaboration tools like Link or Jabber or WebEx, et cetera, go into the boardroom and say, wouldn't it be great if we could all communicate better with each other? It turns out you have to point back to a metric. In today's world of a digital supply chain, it's not the things that happen that are expected. It's the things that happen that are unexpected. And mobility helps people get together as quickly as possible to put things on track. Think about the things that go wrong, that go off the tracks, and how you use technology, especially mobility, to get people together to get that going on. Maybe it's nothing more than giving a sales rep an extra 1% discount for their customer and having that sales manager available more quickly so that, that customer doesn't have to leave and come back. Right? So turnaround time and exceptions is important. And you're going to start to see citizen development, more end users, having tools to build their own things and creating ideas. So incenting that, making people feel as though they can do that with some constructive end, end game to that effort is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony.